So, Chris, you landed an interview with Sir Keir Starmer this afternoon. Yes. Which was good, obviously. And I was watching it and listening to it coming in here. Mm -hmm. And it struck me that it might have been quite tricky for you. And we can have a listen as much as a watch to find out why. Well, I can't ignore the fact that the Conservative... One final question, if I may, on a separate topic. So that we have a decade of national renewal and take our country to a better place than it is. So, Chris, yeah. that's our nightmare, isn't it? You press record and immediately the construction work starts, the rain starts pouring down, the aeroplanes are coming the in, siren, the ambulance is coming. The, the lightest of drizzle becomes torrential, <laughs> but then thankfully it uh, goes away. Yeah, that is the joy of telly, where just occasionally it's an occupational hazard, isn't it, for the likes of you and me, that uh, you know you may not be entirely you know um, keeping hold of your dignity by the end. But hey, we got the interview. Keir Starmer was up for standing in the rain for a bit, and it's February, so what do you expect? And we will dissect the actual content of that interview, oh, Chris, <laughs> about uh, Labour's U-turn on its Green Energy pledge on this episode of Newscast. Newscast. Newscast from the BBC. Hello, it's James in the studio in Westminster. And it's Chris in Westminster too. So the reason you were speaking to the Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, Chris, was because he has made a big U-turn today. Yes. So this is on what, what he calls his green prosperity plan. This is the idea of throwing quite a lot of public money into kind of turbocharging what he thinks are the kind of industries of the future uh, that might have a kind of green tinge to them, but they're also about, he hopes, providing the well-paid jobs of the future, the industries of the future. Two and a half years ago, he said Labour would spend a government £28 billion a year on that. That was diluted in the summer of last year to £28 billion a year by the second half of a first Labour term. So that would be sort of mid-2027 if they were to win the election and only if they thought it was affordable relative to their economic rules. Last few weeks, quite frankly, um, they've been in a complete mess about it and not really been able to give a straight answer to a straight question about whether 28 was about to bite the dust. And today it bit the dust. What we're announcing today is that we won't be making further investments um, and therefore we won't reach the 28 billion, which is effectively stood down. Now, the reason for that is because of the damage the Tories have done to the economy. Um, you know, the interest rates have gone through the roof. We have to adjust. Uh, they want to max out the credit card at the first opportunity. So we've had to adjust to that. But the commitments we've made stay on the table. They will now find their way into our manifesto. So you were pressing mm. Sir Keir on this, Chris, because it's tricky for them and it gets to lots of issues of economic credibility, trust, consistency. There's all sorts of angles that are problematic for the Labour Party here, aren't there? There are. So I think in the end, what they concluded was that they'd hitched themselves to a number that they were getting a huge amount of political heat from for because the Conservatives and others were saying this is massive and you're going to have to either crank up taxes or do a lot of borrowing. But the twist was they'd already kind of acknowledged they were not likely to get to the number anyway. So they were having to defend a number. They were never likely to get what they might argue would be the benefits of it whilst still taking the heat for it. But in junking it, how do you junk that while still trying to claim that lots of stuff you've announced will happen? That is what Keir Starmer's doing. But that's quite a hard argument to, to make and convince people of, I suspect. Um, and then there's the whole thing about what Keir Starmer stands for and whether he changes his mind rather a lot. And that's been a political attack line from the Conservatives for some time. And the basis upon which they can make that argument does include quite a few case studies. A lot of the policies that Keir Starmer stood for when he was running for the Labour leadership, things like uh, getting rid of university tuition fees in England, reforming and, and rebranding uh, universal credit, the benefits uh, package, and various other things. That was then. This is since he's been leader. There's been a whole question around where Labour now are on bankers' bonuses. And so an argument around U-turns is one that his opponents are really going for and this is another case study of that whether or not you think it was a wise move or not so you've been speaking to the leader of the uk labour party mm -hmm. today but we've both been speaking to the leader of the scottish labour party Anas Sarwar. 
Hello. How are you, James? Very well, very well. How are you? It never stops in Scottish politics, so keep them busy. <laughs> nice to see you and hear you on uh, Thank Newscast. You. My, my pleasure to be on. Let's cut to the quick. Big story of the day. Uh, Keir Starmer junking this promise of £28 billion on uh, green projects. Is that a good idea? Look, I think the important thing to stress here is that the outcomes, the plan and the mission remains, and that is to go for clean energy by 2030. That has got massively significant uh, interventions for what it means in Scotland. For example, GB Energy, that'll be headquartered in Scotland, something that'll help create 50,000 jobs, bring down people's bills and help invest in delivering energy security here. Huge investment in our port infrastructure in Scotland, which is much needed if we are to meet the transition, and also looking to strengthen our supply chains here in Scotland so we can not offshore mm -hmm. the jobs in the supply chain, but actually keep the jobs here. I, I now, the honest, now, the reality is we are having to make these difficult choices around the finances because of the economic carnage that has been set upon this country by the Conservatives. When Rachel Reeves made that pledge at the start, you know, compared to now, the interest rates on international borrowing has gone up by four times. And I think it's perfectly right for us to focus on the outcomes okay. rather than the inputs, but also to make sure that we are not risking the public finances, that we're being cognizant of the fiscal rules, but not shirking from the ambition and the Green Prosperity Plan that is going to be crucial to delivering economic growth and opportunities in the UK and in particular for Scotland. I noticed there, Mr. Sorry, you didn't use a yes or a no. So just in the in the interest of abundant clarity, is it a good idea that this 28 billion figure is being dropped? It's a good idea to be consistent with our fiscal rules and not risk the public finances. So that's a yes. And it's, and it's also a good idea to maintain our ambition and our plan to deliver the Green Prosperity Plan, so which is So he's made the right call here, Starmer. Let's just be absolutely clear. I, just want, I don't want to, uh, anyone to come to the wrong I, impression I, of what you're saying. Look, I, he's I think made it, the right I think, call, yeah? I think it's the fiscally responsible thing to do to say we will not hold hard to an arbitrary figure given the economic carnage that's been imposed on this country by the Conservatives. But I think they're also right to say we cannot shirk from our responsibility, not just to avert the climate emergency, but actually the economic opportunities of the green transition, which will disproportionately benefit Scotland. So there is no movement, no stepping back from the Green Prosperity Plan, the investment in that transition, GB Energy being headquartered here in Scotland and the investment, as I say, in that port infrastructure and in the supply chains, which is good for Scotland, good for the UK and actually good for the planet. So you, you say you need to focus on outcomes, not inputs, but one requires the other. And how can you stick to the precise plan and the precise number of jobs that you say that plan will create if you're investing less? The reason why I, I think that is because it's more than just one part. So, of course, the, the figure formed one part of the commitment, but actually the policies within the Green Prosperity Plan is what actually delivers the outcome. And I'm actually struck by whenever you're out speaking to people that are on the front line here, people in our oil and gas sector who want to make that transition, people who are working in renewables who want the government to be on their side and deliver stability in that transition, None of them are arguing actually that we don't have enough financial resource because they believe we can leverage in the private sector money. What they want is a government that's going to give stability to our economy, that's going to act as a partner and collaborate with them in terms of those strategic objectives and is going to help break down the barriers, for example, reforming our grid, which is crucial, reforming our planning system, which is of course devolved, but we're going to be setting out proposals around that in the coming week here in Scotland, but also how we are strengthening the infrastructure that then makes the green transition a reality. Yeah, but and that is going to take time and that's going to take commitment right now. Sure. And so I think how we can leverage in that private sector money to make those investments is a really, really crucial part of the plan. Yeah, but newscasters are clever people and the voters are, are not daft and they know full well that if you say our plan required 28 billion last summer when you and I sat in the same room as Sakir Starmer in Leith where he said he was doubling down on that commitment, you can't say then this plan for this number of jobs requires this much money and then tell the voters the next year that it doesn't. Why? How, I'm so sorry, but how well, does that make any well, sense? Well, 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 two things, James. One is if you actually look at the details 
of the Green Prosperity Plan, the figure that in terms of actual spending commitments within the plan is nowhere near the 28 billion figure that has been suggested as the longer term ambition in terms of investment. Well, I mean, not just suggested, the, I mean, it was party the, policy, wasn't no, no, it? No, no, absolutely, no, and, and, and I completely understand that. But the second point is, you're right to say that the electorate is not uh, stupid. The electorate completely understands that the financial frame in which Rachel Reeves was making that announcement a number of years ago is completely different from the financial situation we find ourselves in now. And God knows the financial situation we find ourselves in come the next general election because we have had the Liz Trust mini budget. We've got the cost of living crisis, the cost of running a business crisis as well, and the economic carnage that is being imposed on this country. And the risk actually, and this is an even bigger and deeper risk, the risk for any political party, one that aspires to be in government, is the risk is you don't learn a lesson from Liz Truss. And that's why I think it's completely responsible for us to say we are not going to set an arbitrary figure that risks economic uh, carnage and further risks people's mortgages across the country. You just described the 28 billion figure as arbitrary, which has been party policy for the last two and a half years until today. Was it a mistake to put that number out there in the first place then? Well, I, I've always been of the view that we should focus on the outcome rather than the input. So and it I was think a mistake? We, well, look, we, economic situations have, have overtaken us, uh, events have overtaken us, and we don't yet know what that economic situation will be. But as I say, I have always been of the view that we should focus on the outcome, not the input. And there are many, many levers that both the UK government can pull to attract the investment we need to see in order to deliver that transition, but also many levers we have to pull here in Scotland. And getting that coordinated approach, I think, is going to be really important let, over the coming let, years. Let's just talk about that impact on Scotland then, because mm. it's obviously the part of the world about which you care most. You said just a few minutes ago in this interview that this plan would still help to create 50,000 jobs in Scotland. In June, when we were at that event in Leith, Labour yeah. said the investment would create 29,000 jobs in the UK by 2050 and could support up to 50,000 jobs in Scotland by 2030. Sorry to just throw all these numbers out there, but I think it really matters. How many jobs have you modelled will actually be created by your plan and how is that affected by spending less. So I think if you look at where the modelling comes in, so again, you're looking at one part of the wider plan. Quite an if important look, one. Oh, no, of, no, of course, I'm, I'm not shying away from that. But if you look at the key strategic parts that are relevant to Scotland, GB Energy that will be headquartered here in Scotland will create uh, jobs. How many? If we build up, if we build up, well, a, a paper has been worked on the specifics of GB Energy, and we're doing that in partnership with the industry, actually, because it's really important that whatever pound we put into GB Energy is able to leverage at least three pounds back from the private sector. That's how we maximise the investment. Hang on, I'm so sorry. Just, just, I'd let me but just quickly me, chip in. I know, I'm so jobs. sorry. I'm going. Exactly, no, no, no that's the no point. That, I know that is the whole point. You've said. 50,000 jobs for Scotland. Now you've said that you haven't modelled how many jobs are going to be created no, 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 at GB you, Energy. You so no, how do you get to that 50,000 no, no, number? No, no, yeah, no, sorry, no, go, you, on, you, go, you on, go on, go on. You didn't let me finish. <laughs> the, the point I was making is, when you talk about these supply chain jobs, we are talking about, of course, the institution itself, GB Energy, but actually that's not where the bulk of the jobs come from. The bulk of the jobs the come from... <laughs> the, the, it's actually one of your producers on the phone. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> so I'm not sure if the sound's going off, but there's one of your producers on the phone. We, we can the, hear you. Sorry, Cord. Yeah, yeah, no problem, no problem. But, the, but the, um, the jobs come from actually the supply chain, so building up the port infrastructure, strengthening the supply chains. For example, cabling plants and cabling facilities that don't currently exist in a meaningful way in Scotland, how we ramp that up. And I know there are conversations and discussions happening around that. It's about the wider supply chain. Newscasters will be fascinated um, and ask about where is the Scottish Labour leader you seek to point out differences of instinct with Keir Starmer and where you don't. And we'll come on to some of those differences that you've talked about in the past in a moment. But I'm intrigued uh, in terms of your argument on the, the 28 billion, which mm. you've set out very clearly, particularly given you can make an argument that Scotland has an outsized role in terms of um, energy in the UK and therefore any sense of dilution around this policy could have a disproportionate impact on, on the very people you're seeking to speak for and represent. Well, actually, I actually think it's the opposite. I think this plan 
and this policy... Put less in and a, get more out? Uh, no, no, no. I think this plan and this policy has a disproportionate benefit and opportunity for Scotland compared to other parts of the UK, and that's why I'm such sure, a I'm not strong champion that, but what for I'm it. suggesting that if, if it is an outsized, uh, an outsized impact for all the reasons people will be familiar with, yeah. if everything else being equal, there is now less going to it, or the prospect of less no, going Chris, to it than could have been the case no, Chris, because, because me, of let, changing let me, circumstances, let, that Scotland's let me, benefit let, would be considerably let, smaller. But Chris, let me challenge that, Mike. If we were sitting here and I was telling you that we were going to make a promise that we aren't able to keep, that would be worse, and it would undermine the opportunities and stability. That's exactly what Labour are saying today. That's no, exactly what you're saying today. No, no, 28 no, billion has got in the no, skip. No, no, far from it. What Labour is saying is we are looking at recognising of the fact of the economic carnage that has been beset upon our country by the Conservatives. We are not going to make those same mistakes. Fiscal responsibility. It's not somebody else's fault, though, that you decided Fiscal to pin your flag to a arbitrary number, as you described well, look, I, it. That was I, a decision I, that well, Labour made. I take what you've said about that. I've always said we should focus on the outcomes rather than sure, the inputs. Sure, I acknowledge so, that. That's questions perhaps you can take up elsewhere. The it, point it, I'm I making will. The question sounds like you need to take up <laughs> elsewhere. No, no, the, the, look, as you can imagine, I have lots of conversations with my colleagues both in Scotland and right across the UK, but I am absolutely determined, and actually it's unshakable, Keir's commitment to the Green Prosperity Plan and the disproportionate benefit it has here in Scotland. That's why it will be a frontal part of our election campaign, not just here in Scotland, but right across the UK. This is a good news story for Scotland, this Green Prosperity Plan, and the outcomes of this Green Prosperity Plan, and one that we are going to champion with ferocity between now and the next general election. Well, you've mentioned the election word. Sound the klaxon. <laughs> Sound the election klaxon. Let me ask you a policy-related question then. Go for it. Sir Keir Starmer says UK Labour will not reinstate a cap on bankers' bonuses. Is that the right decision? Well, look, as I made clear at the time and uh, when I was speaking to one of your colleagues uh, last week when I was uh, in London, is I stand by what I said when the cap on bankers' bonuses was lifted by the Conservatives, that it was yet another example of an economically illiterate, morally bankrupt Tory party that so it's, has the wrong so priorities. So therefore, I'm sorry, but it's the, very easy to follow that logic to say, well, therefore, if you want to keep no, it... No, because we're it, not in government. Not, ...not reinstate it, then yes, but you're saying that you will not reinstate it, and therefore, why is it not evidence of an economically so the, illiterate and morally bankrupt Labour Party? So the, so the balance of what we have to look at, and actually I think the, the details of the broader announcement around financial services has been, has been missed uh, from the conversation we're having today. If you actually look at the details of what was in the financial services review that Rachel Reeves published last week, it was closer ties with the European Union, something that is benefiting all of us in the UK and many people in Scotland want us to have closer ties with the European Union. It was about pushing more jobs out of the financial services hub in London out into other parts of the UK. We have a financial services hub here in Edinburgh, which means more jobs, better paid jobs here in Edinburgh. And it was also about making sure we worked in partnership with the financial services industry in order to inspire confidence to get more investments into, for example, technology and the green revolution that we've just been talking about because so many of the investments have to come from those financial services industries as well as those pension pots, both in terms of public and private sector pension pots. What about the two-child benefit cap? Is that continuing with that? Is that the correct decision? So, Sir so Starmer I, thinks it is. So we were right to vote against the two-child benefit cap. We were right to campaign against the two-child benefit cap and I believe we should move as fast as we can to remove the two-child benefit cap. But again, we have to be cognizant of the fiscal rules and the economic situation that that uh, puts in and if we do become the UK Labour government come the next general election. Anna, as you know, it's the job of James and I and, and others in journalism to ask sort of difficult questions Never. of political, <laughs> political when you, leaders. When are you, when no, are you no, going to start asking? When are you going to start asking them? No, I, <laughs> very good, very good. Um, but there's there's a broader thing here which I'm always conscious of, which is that a, a, a responsible and mature journalism should acknowledge that you know political leadership is difficult and holding senior roles in a political party that uh, aspires to govern or does govern is difficult. And I guess the essence of what James has just been asking for the last few minutes is, is this. The reality of your political life, when mm. in Scotland, for Labour to succeed, it needs to win seats at a Westminster election from the SNP, and indeed at a Scottish Parliament election. From Keir Starmer's perspective, of course he's aware of that, but he's also conscious of winning a lot of seats that have previously voted Conservative. And that speaks to the kind of cephalogical reality of some of those differences of emphasis and sometimes outright differences between you and Keir Starmer and others where there are uh, where there is where there is overlap and I, and I just wonder how you you know how you wrestle with that kind of cephalogical reality and how you make that work in a 
in a way that is logical, sellable, loyal up to a point, but showing differences where you think there are differences. That's the reality of politics, but, and it's a long-winded question, but yeah. I just wonder how you wrestle well, with it's that. A really, it's, no, it's a really good question, and I actually think if you look at how we are doing, we are making it work, uh, because I think the reality is, look, we're in a symbiotic relationship in the sense that, um, you know, for Scottish Labour to do better, we need UK Labour to do better and look like it can beat the Conservatives, and for UK Labour to beat the Conservatives, they need Scottish Labour to do better in, in Scotland. And I think if you look at what's happened over the last almost three years I've been leader, you can see that's exactly what the case has been, the Rutherglen Hamilton West by-election being the perfect example of that. We've gone in that short period of time to being 32 points behind the SNP to now many polls being ahead of the SNP, but feet on the ground, we've won one by-election, we've still got lots more work to do, and we're completely cognizant of that. I think the other challenge is... Where, you where like I that word, think, don't where you I think, cognizant? Where I think you're... Cognizant? I'm just... I, 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 cognizant? It's probably my... It's cognizant. probably, it's like probably it. my word... It's, it's probably the word of my day, word of the day sorry. Maybe just words I wake up with and I use them lots <laughs> of any given day. So well, I, I like it. I'll try, I'll try and use a different one then. No, 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 don't. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm all for cog, cognizant. I mean, I don't know. I don't think I can... I can't say it. And I could, certainly wouldn't be able to spell it. But I'm quite happy to have my vocabulary expanded. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. James listen, is aware of the listen, words. Listen, I, hope you guys I, give, clueless, I, hope, I hope you guys can give me other words of the day as well, and I'll use them on other podcasts <laughs> and other shows when I'm, when I'm on. I'll, I'll give you one word. I'll but give you one word. But can I answer well, the finish point, your point quickly? Yeah, go for it. Sorry, because yeah, yeah, I, I think it's a really, Sorry, really important yeah, question on. actually, which is, look, I, I can totally understand why, particularly in England, uh, Labour has to do a strategy of reassurance and change, and also, in my view, hope. Actually, we need to do less of the reassurance in Scotland because Scotland's already made its mind up it wants to get rid of this rotten Tory government. Uh, well before uh, people in the rest of the UK have now woken up to that same reality uh, and hopefully we'll work together now to get rid of the UK right across the... get rid of the Tories right across the UK. And so right here in Scotland, uh, we have got to put hope front and centre as well as change. And I think we also have to make a values argument. I would argue we have to make a values argument across the UK, but we in particular have to make a values argument here in Scotland because you'll have the false projection from the SNP that somehow people in other parts of the UK don't share the same values as working people here in Scotland. I would actually dispute that. I've spent a lot of time in the red wall of, of England, particularly during the last local government election campaigns. And OK, they may well have taken a very different view to the central belt of, Glas of Scotland on Brexit, but actually many of the demographics, many of the challenges, many of the frustrations, many of the issues they care about are absolutely the same, whether you're in the red wall of England or the central belt of Scotland. And I think far too often we try and pretend the people are ultimately different or they're driven by different issues. Actually, I think they're probably driven by many of the same issues. And that's why addressing those real impacts, I think have to be front and center election campaign and why I think we actually are getting the balance right between the message we have in the rest of the UK and the message we have here in Scotland. But just let me just one final point on this subject. <laughs> Go for it. Give me a new word, though. Give me a new word in this question. The word James. is authentic because the criticism is that Scottish Labour, with its policy platforms on bankers' bonuses, on welfare, on not quoting Margaret Thatcher in speeches or writing about her in articles for the Sunday Telegraph and so on, is authentic Labour and that Sir Keir Starmer's Labour isn't. Well, look, the, I believe Keir Starmer is authentic. I believe his Labour Party is authentic, and I think he is giving us authentic leadership. And I think we have an authentic Scottish Labour Party as well. And that's why I think we have done a great job in getting the Labour Party away from a discussion about whether it survives in Scotland to now actually talking about making significant gains and leading the way in delivering a UK Labour government and maximising Scotland's influence at the heart of a Labour government, making decisions to benefit people uh, here in Scotland. Are Labour going to win the general election? Look, I hope so, but I'm not taking anything for granted. Uh, the polls, of course, many people point to the polls as a positive indication of that general election and Labour being able to win. But there's many, many an example of not just in this country, but right around the world, where Labour parties have gone into elections with significant leads and those leads have narrowed in an actual election campaign. So no complacency. We don't take our foot off the gas. If anything, we now work harder to make sure we get this over the line, that we finally get rid of this rotten Tory government and get back to a politics that's about public service and delivering for people across the country and delivering for people here in Scotland. So I don't think anything is guaranteed. I don't think any result is decided yet, but we've got to make sure we're winning that case between now and the next general election.
And that's Sarah. Nice to talk to you. Thank My you pleasure. very much for joining My us pleasure. on Newscast. I look forward to coming back. Good, Good. to have you. Thanks Thank a lot. Thank you. Cheers. Two Labour leaders on one podcast. Yeah. Blimey. Um, could have had Mark Drakeford on and then we'd have had, uh, then we'd have had three, the leader of, uh, uh, of Welsh Labour, the First Minister in Wales, soon to, soon to stand, soon stand down. What I'm intrigued by, by that conversation, it's actually where our jobs intersect, isn't it? Is the challenge for Labour in Scotland versus, or it's not really versus, alongside the challenge for them in the rest of the UK and how they get that right. And actually, Keir Starmer and Anasawa are at the crux of that, not necessarily dilemma, but not necessarily also easy thing to square. Yeah, and we 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 got into that a little bit there, didn't we, with, with Anasawar. And, and I suppose there's a couple of angles you can look at that from. One, on the specifics of this policy, you can look at how much more important arguably the energy question is to Scotland and mm. particularly to the northeast of Scotland because Aberdeen and the surrounding area and therefore the wider Scottish economy ha- ha- has been anchored in the prosperity that the North Sea has provided for decades and, and it has been a crucial part of the political argument in Scotland for a long time and there is a lot of concern in Aberdeen particularly about this transition to green energy, which Labour is trying to turn into a positive, which could potentially be a negative if you think jobs are going to go. Labour is trying to say jobs are going to be created. So the detail of how many jobs and the credibility of Labour's plan on that is really important. And then the second thing is obviously the wider point, isn't it, which which we, we talked about, which is Labour lost it a lot of traditional left-wing democratic socialist or even socialist voters Mm. to the Scottish National Party a decade or so ago and is very hopeful of winning them back from the SNP at this general election. And the SNP's riposte to try to hold on to those voters is you're not authentic. You are not going to deliver the policies that the people of Scotland want because you need to appeal to a more right-leaning electorate in England. And that is going to be Mm. a big talking point, I think. I don't know if you agree, throughout this general election. Totally. We actually did another interview today, Chris, Mm. um, and that was with Matt Ford, the comedian and host of the Political Party podcast, about his diagnosis with a tumour on his spine And we're going to hear that in full on tomorrow's newscast, but it was a pretty extraordinary interview. It was, because he's an incredible storyteller and he was telling an incredible personal story about his cancer diagnosis, you know, and some really grave and frightening moments. But given his day job as a comedian, uh, he shared some lighter moments uh, in a way that um, uh, will stay with me for a while. Uh, Take a listen to this about his experience of a catheter being inserted... I'll let you conclude that thought, yes. (laughs) So I had an indwelling, I mean, this was nothing. I had an indwelling catheter when I was in there where you've got a catheter that's in. I mean, people would trip over it. (laughs) Stuff would get trapped on it. People would pull it thinking it was like the... One guy yanked it thinking it was like, they were like, oh, you need to unplug the bed before he goes down for a CT scan. Pulled on it. Oh, my God. (laughs) I mean, the slightest, like, honestly... (laughs) I could feel like earthquakes in Japan on that thing, like the slightest <laughs> movement to that cord, and it was like, <laughs> I became acutely aware. I could tell if people were like coming in the car park. <laughs> That's why Bay 3's just pulled out. It's just the slightest touch. And that full interview is on tomorrow's newscast, but from us for today, bye bye. Bye bye. Newscast. Newscast. Newscast from the BBC.